a huge amount of brick and mortar retailers, which I'm sure are gonna be pissed off at this video, in my opinion, on the whole thing. It's like YT, for example, I'm a huge YT fan. A lot of people wouldn't realize that because a lot of these big traditional retailers and big traditional brands um, were shaking in their boots a bit. So we need to like kind of save our asses here, you know? It's just business. Um, Well, to start out with this video, let me just give you guys a little bit of history on my background. I started working at a very typical mom and pop local brick and mortar bike shop as a kid and I worked there for about eight years. Um, it was an awesome place, great experience, learned a ton, got to see a lot of the bike industry evolve over those years. Um, they carried brands over the years, um, mainly Trek and Specialized, surprisingly. Um, and they did other brands in the past, like KHS and Jameis, and let's see, what else filtered out? I mean, Gary Fisher was there before Trek bought him. Um, so I worked there for a long time, and then I found a Worldwide Cyclery. Um, we have three brick and mortar stores, but obviously, as every one of you know that's watching this, we do predominantly online business. Um, and uh, yeah, online is a whole nother topic of controversialness that uh, we could dive into, but um, that's kind of where I came from. I love business and I love economics, so I love looking and trying to understand what's going on in the bike industry. What is going on? And I do feel like worldwide has grown and uh, you know gained a good following and some fun customers because we've tried hard and hopefully done the right things over the years. Um, where consumer direct bike brands come in to sort of start, if you look at the original model. So originally you had um, your brands, right? The guys engineering the things and manufacturing them, even though they're mostly just manufactured in Asia, but mainly engineered in the US or Europe. Um, so you have your bike brands and those guys engineer stuff. Then they would sell them at a wholesale cost to your brick and mortar retailers. Um, of course, at a markup. Then the retailers would put a markup on them and sell them directly to the consumer, um, predominantly through brick and mortar stores. Um, the e-commerce model changed this, right? Online shopping. Um, so when that happened, you had guys like Chain Reaction Cycles and Jensen and Competitive Cyclists all um, really on that wave early on and selling components and complete bikes online. Um, and it wasn't too much different, right? It was kind of the same bikes at relatively the same prices. Sometimes they focused on closeouts and things like that, but it was just like a different method of selling them, but you still had the same puzzle where you had like your, um, your brands, your engineers, your designers, and then your retailer, be it online or in store or both. Um, what then happened, and this is probably only really in like the last five years or so, at least in the US, this happened way sooner and faster in Europe. Um, and the two main brands that really came in and disrupted the whole thing um, were YT and Canyon. So both German brands. And those guys just said, why do we need retailers? We'll just make and design bikes and sell them direct to our customers on our website or in their own own like their own facilities, their own branded stores. Um, so that was what's called like the consumer direct model. Um, this scared everyone because when they did that, they just did the retailing themselves instead of like leaning on retailers to sell it. Um, they were able to offer way more value to the customer. So that was the first big thing that a lot of people were noticing was like, wow, when you look at a YT and a Canyon or any of these other consumer direct bike brands, most of the time, you're gonna get way more value for your money. So you're gonna get a bike and if you look at the frame and the material of the frame and the parts and blah, 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 and then the overall price, versus a bike that's only sold in store through a retailer, you're gonna get way more value for your money. So of course those companies grew in scale because it was just a better business model. They were giving more value to the customer um, for the same dollar. It was an awesome idea. And you know, Canyon has a way bigger breadth of bikes. They're a lot into the road scene and gravel and mountain and everything in between. Um, YT kind of just seems to focus on the higher end mountain bike side of things. Um, so that's kind of what disrupted the industry a bit and freaked a lot of people out. I'm freaking out, man. Because a lot of these big traditional retailers and big traditional brands um, were shaking in their boots a bit because there were these other brands that were growing super fast, eating their market share, stealing their sales, and offering a way better price because they just had a different supply chain, a different business model. They just cut out the retailer and did it themselves. Um, so then you had 
a lot of people sort of furious on this whole thing and the big brands scared and the retailers scared of what's gonna happen. And mind you, this was also happening with the component brands. So you have all these different component brands that um, used to traditionally not sell to consumers whatsoever. They only sold to a distributor, which then sold to a retailer, which then sold to a consumer. Or on occasion, you had a, you know, a component manufacturer sold directly to the retailer, which then sold to the consumer. Um, in the last handful of years, once again, you have these component brands now also selling direct to consumer. And sometimes they're also still selling to wholesalers and retailers and consumers all simultaneously. Um, there's kind of a ball of wax behind the scenes in the bike industry, right? And when we're talking bike industry, I'm talking more like specialty bike industry. So a little bit higher end bikes, you know, bikes that are like $500,000 and up, um, not your department store bikes. That's kind of a totally different segment. That's a whole different conversation. Um, what? Why this made everyone so mad, right? So a lot of the big bike brands realized, Giant and Trek being some of the two big ones that um, initially thought, wow, we need to react to this. We need to like kind of save our asses here, you know? We need to offer customers more value. We need to just be able to sell stuff online. People want to look at stuff and buy it on their computer or on their phone. So they then invented these kind of hybrid models where uh, a customer could purchase the bike online, it would ship to their local um, Giant or Trek retailer, which then would assemble it and deliver it to the customer. Um, so it wasn't quite the same experience, but it was similar. Um, it didn't really fix the whole value proposition thing because you didn't really cut out the retailer, so it was still the same price. It was kind of just now allowing customers to buy it online and in store, but for the same price, whereas you're Consumer Direct boys over here were giving you much more value for your dollar because there was just no middlemen involved. Um, so all this caused a lot of like animosity, right? And you have a huge amount of brick and mortar retailers, which I'm sure are gonna be pissed off at this video, in my opinion, on the whole thing. Um, a lot of these brick and mortar retailers are furious, right? They're upset with these brands because now the brands that they used to sell and were the lifeblood of their business selling these bikes are now selling directly to the consumer online. And the brands are doing this because they don't wanna die and fade and lose revenue to these consumer direct brands. So it's like all these people sort of reacting and disrupting and getting mad and it's just business. Um, it's super fun, it's super interesting. All in all, like it is just, um, you know, capitalism in a sense. Oh, groovy, smashing, yay capitalism. <laughs> like people trying to find, you know, ways to compete and drive more value to the customer, which is killer. And when you look at brands like YT and Canyon and Common Saw, and there's a whole bunch of cool consumer direct brands right now, um, they're doing great stuff. Like their product's great, their pricing is great. It's very competitive. Um, and they're just doing amazing things. Like YT, for example, I'm a huge YT fan. A lot of people wouldn't realize that. Um, because obviously we don't sell YT, we're a retailer, we're, we have a brick and mortar store and an online store, we're a bike shop. Um, we, go, we don't sell YT, we can't sell YT. Nobody sells YT but YT. Um, but YT makes amazing bikes and they do a lot of cool shit. They have this incredible social media presence. Um, they've made some of the best mountain bike content I've ever seen, the Christopher Watkins Jeffsy video. I'll link that below in the description. That was like probably the best mountain bike ad in history in my opinion, I thought it was incredible. Um, they're just making good stuff, right? So it's like no wonder they're growing. They have a great business model, a great value proposition and great product. Now, where's the downside, right? Where is there, um, where are you gonna hear people say like, oh, well, they're bad because of X, Y, and Z. So I look at it as kind of like who you are and what you're looking for. If you're a pretty experienced mountain biker, you can work on your own bike, you can pretty confidently take a bike out of a box and build it and tune it and ride it, then amazing, like you should, you know, it, hurt, it doesn't hurt you at all to buy online, whether that's directly with the manufacturer or with a retailer online, you know, you can handle your own, you can figure it out. If something, there's like a warranty issue, you can call that retailer or that brand, tell them what's going on articulately and explain it because you know the parts, you're, you're into it, you're an enthusiast, you're like a real cyclist or mountain biker. Um, if you're not that, if you don't want to work on it yourself, if you're not confident in building it yourself, um, then there's probably a lot of value in a local retail store, a ton of it, right? And that local retail store, being able to go there and talk to someone who's knowledgeable of that product, who has it assembled for you, who can tune it up for you when you need it, um, there's a ton of value in that, right? So it depends on who you are. If you're an enthusiast, you can work on it on your own. Um, yeah, maybe buying online is a totally feasible, great opportunity for you. Um, if you're not that, you don't wanna work on it on your own, you, maybe you'll love a brick and mortar retailer if you can find a good one. There's all these other arguments in this entire ball of wax, like the idea that if all these brands and component brands go consumer direct, all these brick and mortar retailers will then go out of business, right? Because everyone will just be buying direct. 
And if that happens, then how are people gonna get into the sport? Um, they're not gonna have a local bike shop. Local bike shops won't exist. We all probably grew up with a bike shop in town. Um, if those go away, will you as a kid get into the sport or will you get into skateboarding or football or no sports and play video games? Like doing a lot of running and uh, cycling, swimming. Well, you know all about that. <laughs> no, actually I don't. I play real sports. I'm not trying to be the best at exercising. <laughs> so there's all this like huge like controversy looking at these like big macroeconomic predictions of what could happen to the sport of cycling in general if brick and mortar retailers instead of being dense and all over the world were very sparse and there just like wasn't brick and mortar retailers anymore. Um, and that's like happening in other industries too, right? You have Amazon eating up all this e-commerce and taking it away from traditional brick and mortar of all types of products. And that's what you can hear is called the retail apocalypse. If you ever want to Google that and dig into that. So this is a big, long, controversial topic. Um, I wanted to make a video about it because I think it's interesting. It's fun. It's really cool to see the industry evolve. Um, and there's also brands doing some pretty cool hybrid models, right? So Transition, Revel, Evil, those guys are all doing these unique hybrid models where they're really working hard, like seriously hard to get and match as close as they possibly can the value of these consumer direct only brands when it comes to parts and build spec and quality and all of that. Um, and they're offering them for sale direct, but they're also offering them through like an exclusive number of retailers. Now, where this kind of sucks is when they do that, part of the way they pull that off is they kind of go to the retailer and they say like, hey, your profit margin is gonna suck. Um, so if you're a retailer and you're selling one of these more boutique brands that has a hybrid consumer direct model, the profit margin's kind of garbage. I don't get it. You see, sales one, collect underpants. Sales two, sales three, profit. Oh, I get it. No, you don't, fat ass. Um, whereas if you're selling a bike brand that's like in-store only, mostly the big box brands, um, you probably have a way bigger profit margin. Um, profit margins are kind of like, inconsistent in the industry in general between different bike brands and uh, different models of bikes and different price ranges of bikes. So that's a whole nother topic as well. Um, but that's kind of what's going on. It's, it's definitely interesting. It's cool. Running a brick and mortar bicycle store, whether it's brick and mortar or it's both, like it does online and brick and mortar like we do and a lot of other people do, um, it's not really like a super good business model. Um, it's not a business model that's gonna make anyone rich. I'm rich, bitch! Uh, it's, it's funny the misconceptions I think the general public maybe has. Some people think that uh, bike shops are making this like huge margin. It's like, oh, we sold this bike for 5,000 and we paid 1,000 for it. That is completely incorrect. Um, it's quite the opposite. Um, brick and mortar retail, whether it's in the bike industry or just in the other industries, it's a very thin margin business. If you want to really dig into that, there's a lot of publicly traded brick and mortar retailers on the stock market. Go ahead and dig into their gross margins versus tech companies and service providers. It's a whole different world, but that's another finance topic. Um, so yeah, I rambled on a whole bunch about this topic. Let us know down in the comments what you guys think of all of this. Um, I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. Uh, I'm not offended. I love the amount of selection people get. And yeah, is the business of worldwide cyclery potentially threatened by all these consumer direct component brands and bike brands? Yeah, sure it is. You know, it's, it's not like a, you know, there's some unknown scary aspect of the whole thing. Our margins keep shrinking just like every other retailer. Um, consumers might go direct to the brand if they don't see value in us as a retailer. And so we have to really work hard to provide good value like YouTube videos and fast shipping and having a curation of all these different brands and products together instead of buying them individually with your other, you know, manufacturer direct. So it's a crazy big ball of wax. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna get super offended about this. and. Uh, that to me is interesting, right? Because I like to have an optimistic attitude towards business and the evolution of business. And where people get really frustrated and pissed off is um, when, in my opinion, they're a little like close-minded on the thing and they're very threatened and defensive to the whole thing. And they're just like, F you consumer direct brands, you're destroying brick and mortar businesses. And therefore, uh, you know, no one's gonna get into the sport of cycling anymore. And like, there's a ton of that. Is that right? Is that wrong? Who knows, like a lot of this stuff's gonna play out over the next like 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so yeah, anyways, I rambled on enough. Let us know down in the comments what you guys think of all of this and see you in the next one.